to destroy a whole country because of religion. Unbelievable. It's important for me, myself, it's important that, that people should know about it. The danger of not knowing is very, very bad. It's, it's catastrophe, practically. There's no limit to it. There's no limit to people which won't like horror. There's no limit to people which kill for the, for the fun of just of killing. There was a, there's enough hurt for one person of a lifetime, or maybe of 100 persons. It's enough how much hurt I got it. They cannot hurt me anymore. Prisoner 143425. Felix Opatowski, a Polish Jew and a survivor. 64 years after the Second World War and the Holocaust, traveled back to revisit his past. My kids think it's a dad. He said, we know you cannot be stupid to survive what you did. Why do you do this? Why are you doing this to us? We have to worry about you. And I know the right, but there's something in me could be a guilt. Maybe I have a kind of a guilt that I survived and so many didn't. Felix was born in the Polish city of Lodz. Here, Felix, his parents and younger brother lived a simple life. Well, uh, it, it was like uh, most of the families just stay, uh, they tried to get by day at a time. My father, when he was uh, a youngster, about a young, young man, uh, between 15 and 18 years old, his father, my grandfather, had a farm about 50 kilometers away from, from Lodge. He says, you better go down there. He says, all the young, young people going, is going down there and they're getting a job in the industrial, in the, the industrial thing. And uh, they're working, they're making a living, but uh, I think it's much better than farming. So that's what he did. He came to Lodge and started working in a factory. We were a very, very happy family. I was the oldest one. And I had a brother which was five years young, and that was it. We were happy. We didn't have lots of things that other people do, but we were a happy family. We, we didn't starve, because my father worked, worked double shifts. And, uh, and very rarely I seen him. I seen him on a Sundays. And, uh, and, uh, and I was going to school, and my brother was growing up, and uh, once in a while we were going to the farm visit my farm and bring some goodies from the farm. In that time, in the 30s, in the whole world was, was depression at that time, especially in Poland. Felix returned to the home where he grew up in Lodge. Here, when I was a kid, we were, we were, we were, we were playing co cowboys and, and, and Indians, and from, that t and from down there we were jumping we're jumping down to this place here. This was the place to jump down. So one day, before, one day before holidays, my mother and my mother and my father took out the matras to, to clean it out for, for Eastern holidays. Once a year, they, you cleaned out. So she took out the matras and put it down here. So I said, oh my gosh, when, I, when we're going to jump down now, it's not going to be so hard when I'm going to put the mattress down here. So I called all my friends, and a few minutes here, we went up again 
and we start jumping down. My mother comes out. She starts screaming, and she took that. Would you? Would you? Would you? <laughs> There was, a, there was a Russian Jewish officer which ran away from the from Russian army. His name was Jabotinsky. He was the leader of all the Jews in the world in that time. And he came one day to Lodz. That was in 1937, 38. And he told them, told them what's going really on. The mood was very bad after what he told us. As a matter of fact, when I came home and I told my father, Jabotinsky said that we should all run away from where we are, and if we don't have where to go, we should at least go to the Russian side. So he says, what? He says, you must be kidding. So, so I says, uh, but he says so. He's, don't you think he was right? He says, yeah, I know, but I haven't got, to, I don't know where to run. I haven't got, I can't go to Germany and I would like to go to Russia either. I was done a few hours, a few days, because a quite of my friends did run away to Russia. As a matter of fact, if you met my wife, she did run with her family to Russia, okay? And they survived in Siberia. Wasn't easy, but at least you weren't threatened with guns and you weren't, and you, and you weren't threatened with a gas chamber. By the end of 1939, the Germans had begun organizing the ghetto. Felix and his family were forced from their home. Lots of people which don't know too much about the ghetto or even about the Holocaust, they think that the ghetto was a, a place to live. Yes, it was a place to live, but sometimes in the ghetto it was worse time than in the camps. In my opinion, it was the worst time of my life. In the beginning in the ghetto, there was no food altogether. There was about approximately between 200 and 250,000 Jews living in Lodz. And it was almost about 900 or a million people altogether. When we came into the ghetto, my mother, my mother took us to the place where she was born. She remembered the place and she, when it was holiday, she used to come to visit them. So. So they let us in, because they were already full with people inside. Elsewhere in Poland, Regina, the future wife of Felix, witnessed the harshness of anti-Semitism firsthand. I was standing in line to get some bread, and the German people told me, you cannot stay in line here because you're Jewish. Well, I tell you, I convinced them that I have an Italian father and mother. That's why I looked up. And right there, I overheard they're going to burn the synagogue down at the same night. And sure enough, I wouldn't let my family out of the house, and they burned down the synagogue with everybody in them. The Lodge Ghetto was lucky enough to have a... To have a, a they called it in German, they called the oldest uh, of the Jews, uh, sort of like the, like a Bürgermeister. You know the Bürgermeister, like a mayor, like a mayor of a city, that's it. In German, it's Bürgermeister, mayor of the city. His name was Rumkowski. He was, before the war, he ran our orphanage. So they came into his office just a few days after the war started and they point out to him, I'm talking about Rumkowski now. So if they point about the office, he says, you, he doesn't know what I mean. You, 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 you're gonna, you're gonna be the, the, the chief of the Jews in the ghetto. And lots of people didn't like him because uh, he put the police together, he put the firemen together, he put everything together because he needs it. And, but they didn't like it because they seen they seen the Jewish police, and they, they thought, look at that, he wants to now be a big shot. <laughs> he, has, he has police, but somebody has to do something. He just cannot be the run. People cannot just run around wild on the street. And, and he was running the ghetto for the longest ghetto in, 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 in history in the, in, in the war, in the World War II. Because Warsaw was only, Warsaw was started in 1940, 
and they had, a, had an uprising in 1943. So Warsaw was about three years, but Logi Ghetto was four years. In August 1944, the ghetto was sent into Auschwitz. That's when it was liquidated the whole ghetto. And, uh, and that was just about it for, with, the, with the Lodge Ghetto, because of this one man. This life was really impossible. It was like a, like, like a, a, such a bad dream. It, it's such a bad time that is, I don't know how, I, I really don't know how anybody could survive. And I'm talking about me, I'm talking about all the survivors. So he organized with other guys to be smugglers. What did the smugglers do? They, they're getting a little bit of uh, jewelry, a little bit of money, American money, whatever, as long as it's not Polish money or German money, this was no good. And you jump up the fence, you jump, you jump the fence, and you're running down to, to Polish houses, and they're waiting for guys like us, yes, because that's, that's the living, that's really a living they can make. They sell you the bread and they sell you about it, thing, but you had to have a at the petty. And that's what I was going for a little while, and I brought the home goodies, till one day they, they cut us and they start shooting at us. One of my friends got shot. He was only injured, but he got shot. But I was lucky that the Jewish police cut me when they were chasing us, took away everything what we have, and they arrested us. The jailer that was in charge of it was one jailer in charge. And he told everybody, or his colleagues told everybody, that we're going to go on a transport in a few days or so. And he says, if you have a chance to tell your family. So my mother found out about it. She came over. And a few days later, we went, we walked in, we walked all the way to the railway. And they took us by a train. But we didn't know where we were going. We then squished together. It took about between close to 100 people around a little thing like that. You could only standing standing room have. You couldn't even fall down if you want to fall down. And, and if you had to go, you had to go stand, standing because there was no there was no place to move, nothing. It, it, it wasn't a very pleasant <laughs> drive with the, with the cattle car. While looking through the transport documents at the station, Someone in the group found Felix's name on one of the lists. Fischer, that's me. <laughs> we have found. You found my name. Oh my God, your name? Yeah. Just a minute. Where is this? Thief? Oh, but oh, Felix. Fischer, Fischer. Fischer, yes. Yes. That's Jewish oh my Fischer. God. So these things, you know, those things is not easy, not easy to get through it when your body and your soul and all things is already, is already, is already poisoned with these things. And then all of a sudden you see my name and from where I come from. They even, they even have the street and the number of the house where I, where I came from in the ghetto to go on the transport and to the first camp. I knew that my mother, uh, my mother's name was on, my mother's name was on, on a different paper, which goes to the guest chamber down there. So, so it doesn't do you any good. I had to fight with myself, not to faint. Going in to this, to the wagon train, which standing down there is a momentum. The Polish government left it for. But the Jews are going to come, they want to make a prayer. This, this was the wagon which was taking these people to the guest chamber. They put you in together, squeeze it, squeeze it tight, and, uh, and that's about it. I was so tensed. I was very tense at that time. And, and besides, it was only one night of, uh, of going. Have a night, one night. You can't imagine which is very hard for anybody, a person, to imagine the, the, the hardship, the hunger, and the, and the knowing that you're not going to survive. And that's why lots of people committed suicide. There was no facilities to go out. There was no pails to, to, 
to do something. And, uh, and besides, it, it, it's only one, it was only one night. But it was bad because uh, before, we, we, before they, we boarded it, it's quite a few hours took it. And, uh, thinking of my mother, my brother. I'm sure that my mother and my brother, or maybe or both of them, or one of them probably had to spend his last few hours in this, in this palace here. Knowing, knowing already, because everybody in the ghetto know if they send you to hell from here, they know where they're going. They knew it already in that time. Israel Adoinoi Eohenu Adoinoi Ehot Umain. And this display today is because I have never been since I was liberated so many years since I've been in one of these. I never been before again, and now I know where my mother and my brother died. If I did died in the ghetto or here, and if it's and if uh, and if it wasn't for my mother, for the rest of the Jewish people which went to the guest chamber, to the uh, in Helm, that's that's where the that's where the that's where they transported the ghetto people was with this with this train and with this wagon. It was almost almost daytime when we came into the camp, and that was our first camp. The name of the camp was the White Eagle in English. In Polish was Biały Orzeł, and in German was the Weisse Adle. Our work in that camp was very, very hard. We had to go into a river and stay in the river all day working, in the river. It doesn't matter on the weather, till the snow came around. Then we, then, then we cleared the road from the snow and ice because of the trucks which were going to the, Russian, to the Russian front. And they were dying, the guys were dying left and right. We came in, we were at least about a couple thousand of us. And by the time we left, almost two years later, it was only a few hundred. Either we died working, either we died from starvation, or we died from from other things. They liquidated, they liquidated the Weisse Adler, they, they took us into, they took us into Auschwitz. Right now, I, we, are, we are just about, I would say, maybe five kilometers away from Auschwitz, from Auschwitz camp. But I'm thinking, what I think it is, maybe a little bit more in the middle of it. And I can feel already, I can feel in me already the, the power, the power of Auschwitz, which, which swallowed so many innocent lives. Lives which never had a chance to to live fully, swallow them for only one reason, because they believed a different religion than other people. There were children, there were babies, there were, there were pregnant, pregnant mothers. What, whatever you can visualize, and whatever you can think of, will never be enough what really happened in these few years in Auschwitz. And I, and I can feel it right now. I can feel it. The, the powerful, the powerful wind from Auschwitz, which spread that right over the whole world. Now the whole world knows about Auschwitz. 
That's that's the big that's the power what Auschwitz has, and uh, and it's a good lesson for a good lesson for a lot for the for everybody, I guess to think twice, to think twice about the commandment where God said, "You shall not kill." One thing I remember, I mean a few things, a few times, seeing children, small children walking out of the train from the station, holding, holding toys, their toys, or somebody giving them toys, whatever toys. The bigger ones holding by the hand, the little ones, and singing songs, Jewish songs, Hebrew songs, and the songs from their country singing walking right, right into the guest chamber. You know what you know what this does for you? When I close my eyes with this I can never sleep. So now we came again to Auschwitz. It took a little while. No food, no water, no anything. The only thing, the difference was that they put a, a pail for the latrine. And because they knew it was going to be a few days and a few nights because they were going from one, from one camp to another. I think it was two days and three nights or vice versa. We were very happy to get out. We were going out and all of a sudden, Headlights and a loudspeaker. And it says in, in, in it says in the loudspeaker says in a few minutes these trucks which stand you seen here. We didn't see any trucks because it's night. And the headlight special comes at you. And then the these these trucks gonna put on lights and they're gonna start up the trucks and any, all of you have to run up to the trucks. And who doesn't run up to the trucks gonna be shot. I would say about 10, 10, 12, 15 trucks. And everybody was jumping on these trucks to get away. How many went in the trucks, I never know. Where they, what happened to them, I don't know. And they were running there because they thought that was the trip to safety. Right? Yeah. And the rest of them, the rest of us, which couldn't make it, we the one who was supposed to be killed. Don't figure them out. But I should know already in that time. I mean, in that time already, three years under them, under the yoke of the Germans. No, something like this. And uh, it doesn't matter what you were doing and how good you worked, how hard you worked. It's, they had just had one goal. One goal only: to liquidate all the Jews of Europe. And they almost succeed. It doesn't matter what somebody going to say. We were in good shape, but who wants to die? So, so the talk starting up, starting moving. I think a pistol shattered out or something, and everybody started running, and I started running too. And I'm coming already on to close that truck, and the guys holding out the hand won't help me. I can't make it. I can't make one truck, I can't make the other truck. I was weak. And uh, so on, so on, the truck's gone, and we, we stay in behind. And we are ready to be executed, like the gun said. I mean, they really don't give idle, idle treats, these guys. And they take us on to the, to the shower. Then we came to our shower. Hey, if we get in a shower and we get in clothes, we're not going to be shot. So we're really happy. We were just going down with the hat on. We don't care what's where we're going. Now they line us up to get the number land. And that was all prisoners which we were given. We given it. Then he calls one guy up, you, Rose. So he moves out from the line. And he says in German to him, what is your name? So he gives him the name like everybody else. 
three slugs and done with it with the with the with the, with the, with the other side of the of, of the of the gun. Slugs him once, slugs another time. He fell down on the ground and he kicked him a few times. The gun is almost unconscious. Then he says to him, "This was not your name. You are a Jewish liar." He showed him, this is your name, because we had already put this on. From now on, this is your name. And take a good look, guys. He went to do this to him to make an example of God. And take a good look, guys. You want to look like him? If you forget this number, what you got in the arm and on your uniform, you're finished. And so finally, they took us to a whole camera, they called it the quarantine. Under quarantine, you work very hard, very little food, and if you survive three months of quarantine, they take you back to the to the main to the main camp, which is in Birkenau, and the main camp is number D, the D camp they call it. And the guys who are now a little bit longer, they show you the chimney, and they say that's the only way to get out of here to the chimney. I couldn't understand what he's talking about, because. Is, is any normal people ever heard of this before? And I'm already a year, in the, a year and a half or two in the ghetto, and it's two years there, and I didn't. But that wasn't enough. I had to have more, I had to have Auschwitz. So then I start, little by little, I start already believing in this story, that story, this story, that story, and I think to myself, my gosh, I thought the, I thought the, Vi the Weisse Adler was bad. I thought the ghetto was bad, at least my, my parents went there, my brother was there. This year, how can anybody get out of this one? And everybody said, you can't get out of that. They got your number and you can't get out of that. To go through a day of work wasn't easy. And if it was snowing or raining, you get wet, where are you gonna go? You have to stay. The foreman, which, which, which took you to work, they come in, they, they, they're hiding someplace where they don't have to get wet. You get wet. Then you came to the barrack all wet. What are you going to do? You want to hang up your clothes? You don't, because they steal it. It was about, it was five, between five and six guys on a bunk. Yeah, one level. I usually have the top ones. I didn't mind to have my own lies to fight with, but I didn't want if somebody else's when they, when, when they spread on, on you. That's an oven. An oven? Yeah. That's an oven. They put in the, you make the fire down there. They do have a chimney goes out down there. And not, they have the same thing there as this one. And another chimney goes out here. My barrack was, my thing was approximately after this pose, you see this pose? The first or the second, because I cannot tell because of this. This is closed. First or the second, right on top with Jakob Bartman, another three guys. And the guy for the I play chess was a little bit farther in the middle. This place here was a house, a farmhouse. The Germans were sealed this farm farmhouse to try out the gas, okay. how, how, much, how much time, how much gas they needed, how long it takes to, till the people die in it. And, and at the same time, while they're trying this out, they had a chance to kill about between two and three hundred Jews at one time. And, and, uh, and, uh, and here, across the street, they were buried in, 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 in ditches. That's why they call this, they call this the ditch. And they threw in the bodies to the ditch. And of course, they put a little, all you need, uh, a human being only needs a little bit fire underneath and keeps them burning all the time. This was burning all the time. Now, while they were waiting, they heard screaming, people being gassed in this, in, in, in this little house because, because this was, this was a proof, that, they were, that was a tryout. So the people didn't die very fast in that one. And the crematorium did die fast. The crematorium it took them about, the, between, I think they say, between seven and eight minutes, something. So now, when they heard them screaming, 
these people know there's something wrong. So now when they, when they opened them up, the gas came out and the fumes came out and, the, and, and they seen everything was going out. Now can you imagine them, uh, several thousands of families laying, waiting down the day tongue to go in here. So they rebelled. They rebelled for some reason, they didn't want to go and move. So the assess came around with, with motorcycle and whatever it was and mowed them all down. This was my work. Between these two wires, between these two wires, sometimes were double, sometimes was on a single. They, they called it the neutral zone in Germany. Neutral means neutral, neutral ground. This, this ground has to be cleaned from, from ice and snow in winter time and summertime from weeds that they shouldn't interfere with the electric wires. But most of the time, between 20, 15, 60, maybe 100 bodies were hanging around every day. And, and I was the one, and, and I was the one who had to take the bodies up. And there were special, were special people which go around with the wagons and put them, and put them down and put them to the, to the crematorium. Every day. Some people were throwing rocks just to check it out if it's, if it's still electrified, except they didn't know one thing. Nobody knew, I didn't know the beginning either. In daytime, there was no electricity in these wires, but nobody knew it. I mean, the only time they knew was to grab it, and everybody was afraid to grab it, right? And at nighttime, that's where they put the electric thing on, when they went out, because at nighttime they couldn't see. They have, they have lights of things, but still couldn't see it. And at nighttime, when they committed suicide, at evening, they just went out of the barrack, catch it on. And all over the camp, we were going around and doing this kind of a work. And because of this, the Polish underground uh, volunteered me to work for them, if you understand that volunteering me. When they give an order, you have to do it. Felix found himself now involved with the Polish underground and with the mastermind of what would be the only armed uprising against the Germans in Auschwitz captured British officer Charles Coward, also known as the Count of Auschwitz, needed other prisoners to help transport the dynamite smuggled from the factory known as Buna, or Monowitz, a nearby subcamp of Auschwitz, where prisoners worked, producing fuel and synthetic rubber. And soon Felix was enlisted, smuggling dynamite destined to blow up the crematoriums. They instructed us, if a British officer going to talk to you, and either you, if you understand what he's talking to, it's not important, but just pretend that you understand and nod with your head, or tell you to do something, just, just play along. The underground needed somebody to approach who's in, inside. I was smuggling dynamite mm -hmm. from Buna yes. to the camp. There's five, six guys like me, the runners, they call it, which can come in and take the package away. So, when I got the package, and we, and we went by by it, and I told the foreman, or the assess, that I have to go to the washroom, well, he has no choice, he has to let me go to the washroom. So I go to the washroom, took the package out, and put it next to me. And then a woman, not a man, a woman had to knock at the door right after, that she wants to come in. But there was only one person at the time. Then I go out, she comes in, take the package, smuggles it into the camp. This dynamite has to go into the camp D where the crematoriums are. Because they, they, they made, the, they made the, the plan was to blow up the crematoriums. I don't know how long this was going on. Nobody told me, maybe they didn't know so. Save up enough dynamite to blow up two crematoriums. October 7th, 1944 the uprising planned by Charles Coward and the Polish underground took place. However, not everything went as planned. Something somewhere got wrong. You know, an uprising to make, put together, is not so easy. And, and it was supposed to blow up all the four crematoriums because it was four modern crematoriums. But the other two, either the dynamite didn't blow up because they were called, keeping it underground. Either blow up because wet, or maybe they didn't have a chance to give it, who knows. Blowing up the crematoriums was just one part of the plan. 
the Polish army was to attack the Germans, allowing the prisoners to escape. Yet the attack never came. The Polish army couldn't make him or didn't, couldn't make him or didn't want to make him in. They had to come in from around, they had to get Samuel to come from around. The guys in Auschwitz, they was waiting. So they see nobody comes around. So they ran out to the wire, cut the wire, and they ran out. But they ran into the fire. All the place where they ran was already, was around with, 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 uh, with SS. Laying around on the ground, being, being looked like a, like a, like a, like a ordinary man, ordinary fireman. You couldn't, you couldn't get out. The only way you could have got out by, by, by power. They're supposed to come in, and they're supposed to, this arm killed the all SS which were down there and get all the ammunition what was down there and, and then blow up then blow up the, the ammunition and burn out this thing. But didn't succeed. But they succeed in closing up two crematoriums, one of them for six weeks, one of them for two weeks. Number two number one was only for two uh, two weeks in uh, not in order. Number 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 two was six weeks not in order. And number three or four was burned to the ground. Then these guys, which walked and, and, and inside, they got so mad that the other blew up. They, they burned to the ground three and four. Or to the ground. They killed them all, of course. These, these guys really commit really suicide. This is the end of Auschwitz, of Entsbergenau. See the wires there? And the, the, the guys which burned down, this, was, this wasn't dynamite, this crematorium was burned down by the inmates. And after they burned down, they, make, they, they, they went to the wires, they cut the wires, and they ran out to the forest. The, these people, we didn't know really where to run. North, east, west, south, we didn't know what to run. We just wanted to run out. So they ran out, and a, few, a day or so later, every, every one of them got cut got cut in, uh, in the forest, and they brought them back, and they slaughtered them right, right in front of this crematorium. So now, thanks to this two crematoriums down there, which one of them, one of them was out, number two was out for about between four and five weeks. Number one was out maybe for 10 days or two weeks or even less. All these trains which were coming from, all these trains were coming from Hungary, we're supposed to go straight to Auschwitz on the road. They, they derailed them to another city and they never came into Auschwitz. And these people are never going to know why they are alive. They're never going to know if they would have died. They never know nothing. Thanks God for that. There must be, must be maybe, I would say, about a half a dozen trains like this in, in the last few weeks. But thanks to these guys here, which died at this crematorium by doing it burning down the crematorium, which they had to stop gazing for a little while, and, uh, and at least uh, at least was some revenge against the, the Nazi oppression. Because of the efforts of Felix and these brave prisoners, thousands of Jewish lives were spared. In that sense, the uprising designed by Charles Coward was a success. And I don't believe in angels, and I don't believe in God, and I don't believe all these things. But to me, Charles Coward, he was like an angel. As a result of the uprising, anyone suspected of involvement was tortured by the SS. Felix was hit so hard and so many times, his eye actually fell out of the socket. Despite his horrible condition, he was able to push it back into the socket and save the eye, but not his vision. The following round of interrogation involved the SS ripping his fingernails off one at a time. Felix would not offer any information and was released to his barracks in a near-death condition. Many others did not survive the torture. The Germans are not exactly dummies. Little by little, they figured out how the dynamite came to the, to the crematorium. Four or five girls, I remember five, I thought it was five, were hanged, were hanged 10 days before the Russians came in, in Auschwitz. And I was at the hanging. 
The Germans dealt swiftly and ruthlessly with those involved in the uprising. Yet through all of this brutality, Felix witnessed something strange. So all of a sudden I seen a few hundred guys, I think it was two, three, four, at least 400 guys marching out from the crematorium and uh, lots of Germans with guns and, and even, even uh, 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 a sort of a, like a tank was behind them. And then what didn't, we didn't see this before, as long as we were in Auschwitz, a group like this should singing. You get clubbed to death or have death just by tacking. Now they sing a song. And that was the song what they were singing. Sveta poikt on unser trot mir senen do. By this time, the Russians were closing in. The SS had orders to demolish Auschwitz and leave no survivors. Close to 100,000 prisoners were assembled to make an eight-day journey on foot. They did not know their destination or their fate upon arrival. That was the death march. From here, in January, January 1945, the, the 17, the 18, of, the 18 of January, we marched out 100,000 people here, and that's the time, and that's, yeah. And, and we marched till down there, and about 100,000 of us, and how we made it, I still don't know. And in Bratislava was a train waiting for us. They gave us the first time in about 10 days, a little hot, hot soup and bread. And they, they packed us in like the herrings in the, in the open, in the open cars. So, but, and they took us in a brother's house to, to Mauthausen. So now we walked out from the train, walked out from the train. I said, how the heck is bread laying on the floor? How can bread laying, people which dying for hunger, which dreaming of bread. So how did it? Because about 25% of these people on the train died on the train they didn't have even a chance to eat that bread. But you know something? I want to tell you guys something. As God is my witness, nobody ever took that bread. And we were dying for a piece of bread, but nobody took that bread because these people dying, not eating, not eating, and couldn't eat that bread anymore. And so that, is, that, that was the death march. And then you come, then from down there, they took the train, took us right up to Mauthausen, where all of you are going to see it. And from Latvars, from the station, we have to walk about uh, five, six kilometers, one step at a time. And finally, we came to Mauthausen, they gave us a pick, a, a, a pig and a shovel oh. to, 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 <laughs> to walk. To walk, with what the, miserable to walk in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mine uh, for rocks, whatever it was. Did they need the rocks? No. They didn't need the rocks. They need to kill more Jews. That's why we went down there. And they did. There was, they, they look, it looks like this, but we have, to, we have to make pieces out of them because they, because they could sell this to the, contra to the contractor. Trucks were going out of here. They could, they, they could bring machines here in three months, make more, and we made it in 10 years. We had told so not to, to break him up. These were a little bit too big, but we had told so like half of this, quarter of this, whatever. Uh, first they were dynamiting, the big ones. Okay. Yeah. And then you cut it, you cut it with, with hummus. That's it, eh? Yeah, pigs, hummus, whatever you call yeah. Loaded on the trucks, the trucks came around here, down there, down there is a road to, for, the, for the trucks to go out. And uh, they were going out from here and they were selling them. And uh, they just pocketed the money for every truck, what we were doing. The camp at Mauthausen had a reputation for being even more deadly than Auschwitz. Many of the prisoners there were worked or starved to death. Yet many also died in the gas chamber.
just like this. I don't feel good. No. I don't feel good. Too many memories coming around. Does it make you think at all how close you were to... Yes, too, too close. <laughs> Sometimes too close. Especially when we... Especially when we came in from Auschwitz to Mauthausen. Oh boy. I just... Uh, how, much can, how, how much can you take? You do that march. And after the death march is Mauthausen. And after Mauthausen is milk. And after milk is the, another death march. Here for milk, we, we, we start. They took us out four o'clock in the morning. And they put us on a boat, go to Linz. In Linz, they was assembled. They assembled a few thousand in Linz. And we marched the whole day. Wels, Lambach, Munden. Abens, I remember these. <laughs> when Felix arrived at his last camp, Abenze, he was near death, but still forced to do hard manual labor, digging tunnels in the nearby mountains for the ammunition factories. Felix documents this in his book. Our hunger became so bad that we were crushing the limestone that came out of the tunnels and putting it in our coffee to make it a little bit thick. We were still getting coffee, or something hot and black anyway. In all of Abenze, the grass was gone. We had eaten the grass. All the trees were stripped of bark. The tar was gone from the roofs. That was our only diet for the last 10 days. Felix, you were, you were saying that perhaps if there was only two or three more days, you might not have made it. You might not have lasted. No, two more, no. Most, I don't think so. I don't think two more days, maybe, but I, I didn't think so. And then two more days, no. Two more days, like, what, like, like two years. Because there's nobody, there's nobody to help you. There's nobody to give you a glass of water. See, but everybody was in the same boat. Everybody was dying, left and right. And how much can, how, how long can you go, go around uh, breathing after, after all these years? When the Americans came around, all of a sudden I felt, I felt inside me that I can do something with my life. I can at least get some food. So I went for a run out for some food, and that was a mistake. Boy, oh boy, was that a mistake. Well, Felix, we feel, I don't think we can thank God enough that you're here today. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll wake up in the morning and if my name is not in the obituary, I'm very happy. Well, uh, what can you do? So, you know what? If there is uh, somebody upstairs, maybe I should thank him. But if there isn't, I'm thank him also. But we did not believe in God when we were in the camps. No way. But then again, then again, you take from another side, or God thinks, if there is God thinks that, do I, do I only have, have to serve the, under, the, the poor one, the miserable one, the one, which, the one which cannot make it? That's where the, that's where the saying goes, God helps them, helps himself, right? I think I like this one. All this here is a musky. All the bodies we have found, 
and, uh, and, and inside. There must be here been, I would say, about 10,000 bodies or so, at least. 3,000 bodies were, uh, 3,000 were, were died of, after the liberation. Shema Israel, I don't know, and I hate no, I don't know, a hot. Okay, who do you say use? Ino Tovaria Tomasi Hoho Tova, Ina Masira Boma, Ino Bona Hima Tova Rabunai, Elo Hima Rabunai. After being liberated, Felix settled in Gmünd in Austria. After a long and interesting series of events and a continued fight for survival, he met his wife Regina. They married in 1947 and stayed in Europe until 1949. Shortly after the birth of their first daughter, Felix and Regina moved to Toronto, Canada. They still live there and have four children, five grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. I guess uh, I, can, I can only say one more thing, what, I, what I'm saying for, the, for quite a few years. I was just darn lucky. And that's all, that's the bottom line.